Hello, hello. Okay, we're just waiting uh, some minutes to give some time to other participants to get into the webinar. Okay, and we will start just in a minute. So thank you everybody, welcome for being here. Okay, let's wait two minutes. Hello, Miss Vero. Hello, Miss Patty. Hello, hello. Okay. Okay, okay. Hello, everybody. I think we're a good number now. So if you agree, uh, do we start now? Okay, yes, yep, sure. Perfect, okay. Let me introduce you. Uh, well, again, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you for being in the in the webinar we are sure that we are going to share very interesting things with you and i would like to introduce you to sofia velasquez ramirez she is one of our bilingual or elt coach and she's going to uh, give the webinar today i'm going to read a little bit about sophie she has a bachelor in educational and educational innovation from universidad de las americas in puebla she has a Master of Science in Educational Technology from Saarland University in Germany. She has experience as Instructional Technology Specialist and Coordinator at the American School of Puebla. She uh, has a Curriculum Design Coordinator at Centro Universitario Hispano Mexico. And she has worked as a teacher, researcher, and consultant in the field of education. Okay, so thank you everybody. I'll let you with Sophie and I'll be in touch with you as well in the chat. Thank you. Hello everybody. Welcome to our webinar. I'm very glad that you're all here. I'm gonna share my screen with you so that you can see my presentation. Here we go. So the webinar today is called Understanding My Learners. I'm going to share with you the goal that we are aiming for today. Okay. The goal of this workshop is to guide you teachers in designing and implementing instructional activities that will maximize student learning. To reach this goal, we're going to take into consideration learning styles, personality type, inclusive teaching, and motivation. This is, to me, a very worthwhile goal. I hope you think so, too. In here, we can see the topics that we will uh, manage today. We're going to start by recapping some key theories of learning, the learner's role in particular, how these theories approach the learner's role. We're going to see what different types of learners we can find in our classroom, how to identify and classify them. I will share with you a model called the VAC model, to identify learning styles and we will uh, I will present to you a questionnaire and we will take a look at some of the questions so that we can find our own learning style. Afterwards we will discuss the characteristics of the three main learning styles that we will uh, discuss and then we will focus on how technology can help us approach these different learning styles. At the end, towards the end of the webinar, we're gonna see a particular app that is aimed to kinesthetic learners, since I think it's very interesting. We will end the session with some conclusions and a QA. Okay, so first I would like you to look at this picture. Think a little bit about what we see here. 
do we think that every learner is thinking the same thing? Are they the same as people? Could we infer that they have the same interests, that they think in the same way, their mind works in the same way, or is it different? What do you think? Are they understanding the same from the class? Are they paying attention to the same things? I would like to take a look at the chat and uh, see what you guys think about this. If you, if you wish to, you can also open the, your mic or raise your hand, in, uh, preferably, so that we can listen to your ideas. Okay, so we have some people uh, sharing with us that they are all differently. Every, every student thinks according to his or her experience and interesting. Yes, that's a very good idea. They're thinking in other things. Why are they thinking in other things? Is it because of their personality? Is it because the class is not interesting? Is it because of how they perceive the class? They're on understanding different things because they have different interests. Very good. Thank you for your participation. OK, so um, why do we think Let's go to our next slide. Is it important to understand our learners? I want to see what you, th what you think in the, in the chat once again. Why is it important to understand our learners? Or is it not important to understand them? How does it um, change our practice as teachers? to help them learn better, thank you. To find out the way that they learn, to be empathetic of them, yes, thank you. For them to enjoy learning, that's also very important. To discover how to transmit the knowledge according to their way of learning. Yes, these are all great ideas. Thank you for participating. So I'm going to now we're gonna now uh, share some learning theories. So I really hope this is not completely new information for you because we're not going to go very deeply into the learning theories because that would be a full webinar on its own. So we're gonna focus on what these main theories tell us about the learner, how they conceptualize the learner, how, how they interpret the role the learner plays in learning. So we're going to start with uh, behaviorism. You're all probably familiar with this. According to behaviorism, learners are passive. They react to stimuli defined by the teacher. In this learning theory, or according to this learning theory, responses from the student that are followed by reinforcement are more likely to happen again in the future. So this is how we get students to behave the way they should in order to, to reach a learning goal. The teacher is in full control normally because it is the teacher that designs the learning environment and the, ex and the experiences. Next, we have cognitivism. In this one, we're not only looking at behavior, but we're also looking at the mental processes. So according to cognitivism, learning means processing, storing, and retrieving information. For cognitivism, the learner is somewhat like a machine. The, as I said, the mental processes are the most important, and the role of the teacher is to encourage learning by organizing information in ways that are easier to process, making associations with previous knowledge and making the information meaningful, because this is what makes it uh, easier to storage, basically, in our minds. Next, we have social learning also called social cognitive theory. According to this uh, theory, learners are very observant and this is how they learn. They reproduce the behavior that they observe when they identify positive consequences in others. Not only positive consequences, but some other um, conditions have to be met. So we observe basically our peers mostly because they are people that are similar to us. Uh, the same age group, maybe the same gender, people in our same school, and we also focus on role models. 
All other processes that are key according to these theories are that we must be paying attention, of course. If we're not paying attention, we're not going to be able to uh, learn this behavior. We need retention, so the ability to remember this uh, thing that we observe. We need to be able to reproduce the behavior, which means that if we see a ballerina and she's doing an amazing movement, but we're not physically capable of doing that, we're not going to be able to take that step and reproduce it at least uh, at the beginning. And finally, we also require motivation. So these are the conditions that have to be met to learn by observing. Next, we have humanism or humanistic learning theory. In this one, the learner is uh, very active. So the learner is really at the center. The goal is self-actualization. And the theory focuses on the learner's creativity, their personal growth, and their choice. In this theory, students are meant to decide almost everything in the learning process. So the goals, the materials, the methods, and even the evaluation. The role of us as teachers is to coach them. So we help them with learning strategies to reach their goals. And lastly, we have constructivism. According to this theory, also the, the learner is very active and they have to construct meaning from their experiences and interactions, both, both their current experiences and past experiences. According to this theory, learning goes beyond some objective knowledge that is out there, some universal truth that you need to acquire. In this uh, theory, the learners are creating their own meaning. That's why, that's why it's called constructivism. And the teachers must facilitate this process by creating meaningful tasks and making sure that these tasks occur in authentic context. So all of these theories are important. I hope I did a good job of uh, summarizing them. I hope this is, as I said, not completely new to you. They all contribute to a deeper understanding of how learning takes place and of the different roles of both the student and the learner in the learning process. Uh, what I want you to take away from this slide is that uh, these are different conceptual ways of understanding learners, but we don't necessarily need to choose just one. We can just let all of these theories inform our teaching and take ideas from them and keep them in mind so that we can use them in different situations that arise in our classroom. Okay, so now that we know this first part, how can we further understand our learners? These first few, uh, few theories give us a very general conception, some ideals. How can we get a little bit more specific? So my suggestion here is uh, identifying some types of learners in our classroom. So every classroom will have a diverse group of learners and they'll have a variety of characteristics. So basically we're discussing diversity here. They're gonna be very diverse. When we have, in a brand new year, brand new school year, we'll, we're gonna get to meet these kids or students, whatever they, their age is, and we will see that they have various quirks, peculiarities, some personalities, and this manifests during the, the learning process. They'll have obstacles, they'll have advantages, preferences. And what I want you to think about is that we have models that are useful because they allow us to kind of group together some students because it would be impossible for year after year to completely personalize the learning process. It is a worthwhile goal to try to personalize it individually, but a, a good starting point is to identify uh, uh, groups. So this is how models are useful. In the case of the ones I'm presenting today, I'm talking about learning styles models. These describe how people process new information and how they prefer to learn. So I'm gonna uh, focus on one in particular so that we can be aware of learning styles and see what strengths our students have to enhance their learning process. So the one we're focusing on today, as we mentioned in the very beginning, is the VAC model. This was introduced by Walter Burke 
1981. So it's been around for a good number of years and we're still finding it useful today. This uh, model takes its name from, uh, it's an acronym basically. So it identifies three learning styles. Whoa. The first one is the visual style, the auditory, and the kinesthetic. Maybe some of you have heard of this model. Other authors since Walter Burke have also worked with this model or changed it in some ways. There is, for instance, Neil Fleming, who was a teacher from New Zealand and coined the VARC model. So basically he added an R somewhere in there. And this is uh, to signify the reading and writing learning style. In this original VAC model that we're talking about today, reading is uh, somewhat included in the visual learning style and writing in the kinesthetic learning style because it involves body movement. Uh, there is also people who do not have a standout mode with one preference score, and these are called multimodal learners. Basically, what it means is that uh, you either switch from one style to another, depending on context, or that you use them all at once, basically. We are all slightly multimodal, but most of us will have a preference, uh, a dominant preference, but not everybody. Okay, I want to see a little bit of what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. I hadn't seen this one about constructivism. Teacher role is to make scaffolding. Yes, so that we can uh, allow our students to reach the next level in their learning. I'm glad to see that uh, the image seems to be working better now for you. We're going to keep going then. So now that we know what learning styles are out there, how do we know which one we fall into, which category we fall into, or our students? Well, uh, today I'm going to present to you uh, an adaptation of one of these questionnaires so that we can uh, do it right now kind of quickly. Don't worry, afterwards I will share a link to the full questionnaire on the chat so that you can also uh, share it with your students, use it for yourself and for your students in your classroom. Uh, this is not the only questionnaire. The, ones, the one that we're basing ourselves on today is by O'Brien, but there are other questionnaires that identify your learning style, and there are even some more casual online quizzes that you can take. So I'm going to start. I'll show you how we're going to handle this. I'm going to read to you some statements. I'm going to have the chat open so that I can see what you think. Wow. You don't have to share it um, on the chat. I want you to think for yourself. So when I read a statement, I want you to think about, reflect, whether you think this, you identify with this statement. And I'm going to go through some boxes. So three statements per box. Don't worry, it will make sense in a second. So um, if you have some piece of paper and pen nearby that you can use, uh, feel free to sort of keep track of your score or, or, or the statements, how many statements you are identifying yourself with, with per box. But if you don't have something to write with, don't worry, it's not that many, so I'm sure you can just uh, keep it in your mind. Okay, so this is our first box. I'm going to start reading and just reflect and think if you're identifying yourself with this, uh, with this statement. I don't like to read directions. I'd rather just start doing. Does this sound like you? Is this something you do or do you normally read directions first? Just think about it. The next one is... I solve problems through trial and error approach rather than a step-by-step -step method. Do you identify yourself with this statement? Think about it. You don't have to tell me. And lastly, for the green box, I am not skilled in giving verbal explanations or directions. Okay, I hope you're thinking about it. Imagine that you are uh, checking with a, with a check mark your statements like this. And let's see how it goes at the end. So next box. 
It helps to use my finger as a pointer when reading to keep my pace. Do we identify ourselves with this statement? Let's think about it. When I read, I mix up words that look alike, such as them and them, bad and that. Maybe, maybe not. Next statement, I remember things that I hear rather than things that I see or read. Okay, so try to have an overall uh, feeling of how much you are identifying yourself with the orange box. And lastly, we have the blue box. I enjoy doodling and even my notes have lots of pictures and arrows in them. Let's see how you feel about that. Next, if I am taking a text, uh, sorry, a test, I can see the textbook page and where the answer is located. So I can see the textbook page in my mind, basically. And last one, it helps me to look at the person while listening. It keeps me focused. Okay, so also try to get a feeling of which box you identified yourself the most with. If you identify yourself um, mostly or very dominantly with one single box, that means that one is your dominant learning style. We'll see which is which in a minute. You probably already have some ideas, um, but that would mean that is your learning style. If you identify yourself with two boxes, that would mean that you have more than one strength. And if your preferences were roughly equal among all three boxes, roughly equal, because maybe we all have one check in every box, but if we are roughly equal in everybody, in, in, in all of them, sorry, that would mean that we are multimodal learners. We do not have a dominant learning style, but we can move about them uh, depending on context. Okay. So I would like to take a look at the chat uh, for you to tell me um, okay, I don't seem to be getting new uh, new messages on the chat, but let's see if you have an idea of what the green box represents. Let's write on the chat if you have an idea of which learning style is the green one. Okay, we have a guess for kinesthetic, another for kinesthetic, verbal linguistic, kinesthetic, kinesthetic. Okay, let's see. Yeah, basically the green box represents our kinesthetic learners. So if you identified yourself the most with that box, then you would be a kinesthetic learner. So what do we think about the orange box? Which learning style might that be? A, auditory, auditory. Oral, yes, auditory. Yeah, you're all very smart. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, of course, it's the auditory learners. And our blue box would be visual. Yeah, it's the, the last one, the visual learners. So I hope you were able to identify the one that you most identified yourself with. And maybe you will find something new about yourself or be able to put a name on something you've always known, that you have this preference. And maybe you found that you are a very well-rounded learner. So you would be multimodal. So now that we know this, what do we do with this information? Basically, we have a challenge. We may be dominant in one learning style. Let's say I'm a very auditory learner. And I enjoy talking things out and listening to instructions. And I don't very much like reading. It's more difficult for me to focus on reading. I'd rather somebody just explain things to me. But th there are uh, students in my classroom 
that have a very hard time focusing on something that they're, they're just listening. They need to have some visual aids or they need to see a demonstration when things are, are being handled with their hands. It's, some, it's a challenge to, to be able to let go of our own preferences and try to think about what, uh, what the preferences of our students are. By understanding the kind of learner that you are and the kind of learner that your students are, you can gain a better perspective on how to implement these learning styles into your lessons plans, lesson plans, sorry, and your study techniques. So this is the challenge that we have. We might not understand exactly how everybody's minds work, but it is important to keep it in mind. However, there is also a warning to be made. These learning styles are meant to be understood as a preference. So it is useful for teachers to handle, to, to, to have a handle of this knowledge so that we can accommodate the diversity of learners that we find in our classroom. However, we should not pigeonhole our students. This means we do not limit them and think, oh, since you're a kinesthetic learner, you're never gonna be able to pay attention to the instructions that I'm, that I'm explaining to you orally. No, because this would, this would feel like we're, um, we're limiting our students. They also have a responsibility to develop their own learner, learning strategies to fit their own styles. And we as teachers can help with them with that. If, if they reach university level or uh, continuous education when they're older, professional development courses, they might not have a teacher who is so, um, so empathetic that they're going to think about everybody and the diversity of the learners in the classroom. Maybe they just give lectures, just talking, no visual aids, no practice. Well, uh, students also have the ability to develop these learning strategies. Maybe they can record the lecture, maybe they can take notes, maybe they can find uh, team members who, with whom they can share and practice and create some practical exercises. There are many things that they can do. So once we've covered that warning, we're gonna share some characteristics of these three learning styles. As I said in the beginning, these are generalizations. If you have a dominant preference for one of the styles, you will probably identify yourself with most of the characteristics that we will share, but probably not with all of them. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna start with the visual learning learners. Visual learners absorb new material best when it's presented to them visually. So they appreciate graphs, maps, charts, lots of color, uh, shapes, patterns, things like this mind map that I have on my slide. They prefer visual instructions. Sometimes those instructions can be text, but it's also useful if they're more uh, visual, like they have arrows, they have uh, diagrams. They are very observant people, and you can often find them in your classroom doodling in their notes. This is very common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I'm reading your comments. Kindergarten teachers use a lot of visual and kinesthetic methods. Yeah, that's also true. So we're going to hear about the auditory learners now. As the name suggests, they learn best when they receive the information, the information through their auditory channel, so their ears. They like to have things explained to them verbally, and they often need to talk through the problems, even if they are by themselves, they will talk it out. They usually also hum when they're solving problems because they, they enjoy having or, or they need to have their uh, auditory channel occupied, engaged. Um, they greatly benefit from group discussions and to have audio recordings of the lessons that they can listen to later. It's, it's not as useful for them to take notes. They prefer to hear the stuff again. And lastly, we have the kinesthetic learners. They process the information best when they have the ability to physically touch things and engage their bodies and their physical environment directly. 
they need a lot of hands-on experiences. So yes, as uh, the teacher was saying in, uh, a minute ago, this for younger students, this is very highly developed. Um, kinesthetic learners in general of any age best acquire concepts of math when they mani manipulate objects, so tangibles, and science, science concepts by recreating experiments. They sometimes uh, find it hard to sit still, so they may be distracting others in the classroom. They shake their legs, they are touching stuff, playing with, with stuff, and they often walk around the room when they're thinking, even when they're on their own. So it's not just about uh, experimenting with things with our hands, but also about um, engaging our body, even if it, it, it's not related to the task. So now that we've heard these basic characteristics, later we'll, I'll give you some, some more detail. But up until this point, I want to see what you think. So we're going to take a little bit of a poll. Uh, this is the link. And if you want to participate with your mobile, you can scan the QR code. And I will also copy this link for you in the chat so that you find it easier to participate. Okay, here it is in the chat. I hope you can click on that. Or as I said, scan the QR code. I'll give you a few seconds before we start showing the, the screen with your answers. Okay, so I'm going to activate the question. It says, what activities do you use that benefit the visual learners in your class? Mention the learning style in your response. So um, I'm only allowing one answer per participant. So think about any, any of the three learning styles and share some of your ideas of how you are um, um, benefiting these students through your activity plans just mention try to mention the kind of learner that you are approaching so either visual auditory or kinesthetic when you write your comments okay okay um if somebody can just confirm to me that you are also looking at the responses on my screen, please. Yes, Sophie, we are. Thank you. If you were not able to, to go in the link for some reason, feel free to also participate in the chat and I'm also reading that. Okay, so let's see at some of our answers. Uh, visual support, of course, watching videos for the visual learners. Theatrical performances, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, videos can can cover all three types of learners. That that's that's true, depending on, on the type of video. You can also, as, as as some of you have already noticed, you can vote on the on the suggestions that you find very useful. So just uh, click on the top arrow. We have also um, total physical response. Yeah, that's also very useful. Chants and songs, flashcards, posters alphabetic classroom yes that would be i would imagine for either visual or auditory learners mind maps here in the chat powerpoints and audio or powerpoints of our explanations let's see below here role playing yes that's very useful for the kinesthetic ones Flashcards, we've seen that one. Lyrics with music. Readings, videos, or plays. So here it's a little bit for everybody. Uh, online games and a website called Go Noodle with some games. Miming, vocabulary words along with music. Yeah, that sounds like full body engagement. Very, very useful. Video booster. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for mentioning that. 
Okay, so we have we have uh, very good suggestions. As as always, you're all teachers, so you you know this. You're use, you're using different uh, types of um, of activities, right? Diversity is key here. If we're always doing the same thing, then we risk leaving leaving some of our students out, and they're not benefiting as much. Making diagrams on the board about the grammar structures, yes. Use different colors for different elements. That very, that's very uh, useful for visual learners. Um, sometimes you still use, uh, okay, the green, you, you circle the verb in green and years later you still remember green is the verb, for example, no? Uh, you can also have rhymes for, uh, for auditory learners, they are very useful, as, as well as uh, the, yeah, tongue twisters here, comics, songs. Okay, so I feel like we have a very good understanding so far. I'm going to share with you, I'm going to uh, go back to my presentation, and I will share with you uh, a very nice table with some more characteristics that I think you as mostly English teachers will really appreciate. So we've already discussed how the three uh, learners, three type of learners learn, basically. We're going to go now to how they handle spelling. So visual learners tend to recognize words by sight and they rely on how the word looks like while auditory learners use more of a phonics approach. So they have a very keen uh, sense of, uh, of hearing and they, rem they sound out the words mostly. Kinesthetic learners can often be poor spellers, not always, but they tend to remember more with their hands. So they tend to write the words so to determine if they feel right. When it comes to reading, Visual learners tend to like long descriptions and they have a very vivid imagination so they might see the scene that they are reading about on their, uh, on their mind and they can concentrate very intensely when reading. Auditory learners, on the other hand, they don't really appreciate the lengthy descriptions but they enjoy the dialogue and plays mostly. They don't pay too much attention to illustration and they are the ones that tend to move their lips when they're reading. So even, even when they're adults and they manage reading, they learn to read, they still uh, tend to say the words softly when they're reading. And lastly, kinesthetic learners, uh, they don't enjoy reading as much as the others, but they do like stories with lots, lots of action. And you might see them moving about when they're ready, when they're reading, sorry. So playing with their hair, uh, playing with their hands, uh, every, everything that is fidgeting, basically. When it comes to memory, visual students are um, good at remembering faces or what people look like, but forget, to, to forget the names. They tend to write things down and take notes. So this is their strategy to when they need to remember something important. Auditory learners uh, memorize stuff better through repetition. So they will talk out loud and, and repeat, for instance, their grocery list. I need apples, 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 and they will remember better. They forget faces, but remember names. And the kinesthetic learners remember best what was done, but not so much what was just seen or talked about. So they remember the action the most. In terms of their distractibility, which is very important when we're talking about classroom management, visual students will be more easily distracted by movement, not so much by sounds, and the auditory learners are the opposite. They will get more distracted by sounds because their, their auditory channel is their dominant one, not so much by movement. And kinesthetic learners, they will most often seem distracted when we are giving a presentation because they don't pay so, so much attention to the visual and the auditory. However, they, they might still be paying attention, but looking elsewhere, uh, distracted by some movement or, or by something they're doing with their hands. 
When it comes to problem solving and the response to new situations, visual learners are more deliberate. They make plans in advance. They write things out, make lists, step-by-step uh, -step lists, this type of thing. And they are very good at finding the structure or patterns within a problem. Auditory learners basically talk things out. So they, um, they benefit a lot from having other people to discuss with, but if they're by themselves, they will still uh, try their solutions verbally and discuss pros and cons. And the kinesthetic learners tend to, um, tend to choose strategies that involve a lot of activity that are very physical, and they proceed directly to trying things out. So touching, feeling, let's see if I can turn this, and not so much just thinking first. It is useful to keep this table in mind, these little um, characteristics. As I said already, not all of our learners will fit so neatly into one group. But if we, if we keep in mind that our group is heterogeneous and we will have students that work in different ways, um, our, our teaching will benefit from it. Okay, so um, now we're going to reach this part where we discuss technology. What about technology? Technology is very uh, dominant now in schools. Everybody is talking about it, everybody's using it as a, at least a little bit. And right now when most of us are working uh, virtually, so more e-learning strategies, we absolutely need to take advantage of technology. It provides us with, with an incredible opportunity to approach a diverse range of learners, not only because we can use a range of digital applications and tools, but we can also select some that are flexible or rich enough that we can cater to most needs at once. So we have some of these uh, technologies that are very well-rounded and useful for everybody. So once again, I'm going to ask to hear your ideas. So now, this time, we're going to go into Padlet. I will once again share the link with you on the chat. And you can go ahead and start adding your, your suggestions. Here it is, yes. Okay, um, we're having some uh, image problems as I read, so I will stop my camera for a bit so that you can probably see the presentation better. And please uh, refer to the chat so where you will find the link and I will share on my screen what everybody is uh, showing us. So now we are going to this one. Perfect, we already have some participants. You found exactly what I wanted you to do. We have these different columns for the different learning styles. So if you know of, of technologies, let's think of, remember that the focus here is edutech. So if you have specific digital tools, for instance, video, for instance, a, a particular app, um, I don't know, virtual reality, audio recordings, these type of things that are technological, right? Because first we were, we were discussing just in general, classroom, classroom strategies. Now we want to focus on the, on the tech part. Thank you for your participation. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of good things. Spotify, yeah, for auditory learners, graphs and timelines. So what would you use? So let's say PowerPoint or Google Slides is good for multimedia presentations. Movies, yes. Multimodal learners already have some, some suggestions. Experiment at a laboratory for physics, chemistry, math. 
I would say that since we're talking about technology, this could be, for instance, a virtual environment. So a virtual uh, laboratory where we can have simulations of these ex experiments would be a good technology to have for multimodal learners. Chemical explosions, yes. When teaching chemistry, that's very hands-on. Okay, we have gonoodle.com, lyricslearning.com, some websites that some of you are sharing with us. Dictation, yes, thank you for the suggestion. I'm going to give you a little heart. Um, yes, auditory, auditory learners benefit a lot from dictation because uh, writing might not be their, their strongest uh, uh, skill. So when they dictate, they have, they have uh, their notes ready for them. Audio stories for auditory learners here in the chat, thank you. Video and interactive games. Uh, the, the very good thing about interactive games is that they also benefit kinesthetic students because um, sometimes we only conceptualize the kinesthetic students with like very like 3D touch, 3D involvement, but it can also be just clicking through a screen with some drag and drop exercises, for example. This is already Mm, adding motion, movement, to what would otherwise just be a static visual image. So this is already more, um, more uh, involvement uh, for, for the kinesthetic students. I think we should plan a class with all kinds of learning styles for all kinds of students. Definitely, yes. Don't forget the music. It will be fun for everybody. Exactly. And also, Maybe some days, some activities might not be fun for everybody, but you will have uh, students that benefit greatly from them. So for instance, it might be the case that you have some students that are very shy and don't like to stand up and do a dance in class, but you will have some students that will uh, remember that activity the best. So it is important to sort of switch and, and find diverse activities so that we can, we, we can approach all of our learners. Riddles, yes, that's very engaging as well. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have, yeah, uh, an, an image that was shared. Thank you, acting or performance. Yeah, we can have that here in the auditory style, or we could also have it on the kinesthetic. Flashcards. Flashcards are others that um, I'm going to add it here on the auditory style as well. There is an app called Quizlet. Flashcards with text to speech function functionality. Yeah, so there it goes, my, my suggestion as well, because uh, flashcards can be, can be very um, visual um, tools, but when we use technology, we can have these sort of apps that we write our flashcards and they will read it for us. So we can be uh, cleaning the kitchen, uh, washing dishes, and be listening to our flashcards. And for auditory learners, that's amazing to memorize and remember. Yes, Quizlet. Quizlet is a website. It's a website where you create, create these flashcards. And there are also some games that you can do. So it would also fall into the kinesthetic style. Go, to, go through virtual visits to museums. Students making covers of Spanish songs into English. Yes, that, that sounds amazing. You can, you can cover all the learning styles with that. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, absolutely. These are, uh, these are um, nice times to be a kinesthetic learner because uh, as I understand it, the classroom, the physical classroom has not always been the kindest to these students because we rely a lot on having all the students sort of sitting still in the classroom. But now that we use technology, we can actually have them move around more. 
And right now with this uh, situation that we're living through at the moment, when every learner is in their house, it's a very good opportunity to have them move around through technology as well. Okay, so we have some very good suggestions. Uh, yes, I agree, Quizlet is an amazing platform. Thank you. Uh, so we're gonna go once again back to our uh, presentation. And I'm going to just uh, quickly go through these uh, slides to see maybe some ideas of, of also how we can use technology for each of these uh, learners. Just very quickly, we have uh, for the visual learners, mind mapping apps, PowerPoint presentations or other multimedia presentations, software to annotate PDF. They might like reading, but it is more useful when they are able to highlight, uh, make arrows, make circles, uh, make doodles, all of these. So also highlighting websites is a good tool. Learning cap capsules on video that are useful. General image and video software maps, blueprints, diagrams, all of it is useful for the visual learner. Then we have uh, some suggestions for the auditory learners. We have audiobooks, podcasts that are very, uh, very trendy right now, video lectures on YouTube, on Khan Academy, on various platforms. Uh, I already mentioned Quizlet. We have digital flashcards with the text-to-speech function so they can memorize better through repetition. Audio recording apps in general. Also, I didn't see this one get mentioned in, on the Padlet. We, we can use um, audio and video calls to discuss topics with other classroom, with specialists around the world, so Skype, Google Meet, even Zoom. These are very good for auditory learners that need uh, a group to um, to discuss things with. I'm going to try to start my video again and you'll let me know if the quality of the presentation goes, goes bad. Okay, uh, we also have the kinesthetic learners. As you can see, I added a bunch of stuff for them because uh, technology is very good for them, actually, I would, I would argue. So we have um, simulations, virtual field trips were mentioned already, electronics, robotics, animations, uh, virtual and augmented reality software, everything that is a touch surface that is very good for them. They can engage their hands, their body, make gestures, including GIFs and video in your, in your presentation. This will give some movement that they can remember better. For note taking, they can use a stylus for tablets, smart pens and pads, handwriting recognition apps, because even though we're using technology, some kinesthetic learners might not uh, benefit as much from just typing. They still need the more an engaging like um, uh, approach of handwriting. So they can, they can use this technology. I mentioned also already for interactive presentations, drag and drop, clicking through some objects. Classroom clickers, these are more uh, for the physical classroom, but they, they also, the ones that you, you maybe press a button for, uh, to, to answer a question. And in general, video recording with role playing, performing a physical task, give a demonstration of how some, th some things are done. These are all great for kinesthetic learners. And you might also be noticing that some of them work for everybody as well. Some uh, specific suggestions for the multimodal learners would be the virtual and augmented reality. We can use everything in there. Um, I remember and missed these uh, kinetic typography videos that have text, audio, and movement all at once. So it's basically the text moving around. That, is, uh, that includes all three senses. And this explain everything is the name of an app where you can record your own class. So teaching others, you, I think you will agree with me that is a very um, engaging action. So you need visual aids, you need your oral presentation, you need to move your body, you're doing everything basically. And you can also have some flexibility in your assignments and allow students to choose their own tool to deliver a project sometimes. So not always relying on them writing an essay, for example, 
but maybe they prefer to do a video demonstration or maybe they prefer a podcast. So we can have also that, um, that freedom for them. So I hope you find these, uh, these suggestions useful. Um, everything is good, thank you. So basically technology in the classroom makes learning more fun. So we, are, we have now discussed some technologies either in general or naming also specific tools, digital tools that we can use so that we can uh, create more engaging lessons. We can actually benefit all of the diversity that we have in our classroom, all of the, all of the characteristics of our students. And we can allow them all to shine. If you uh, recall the table that I showed a few slides ago, you might be able to see that um, the kinesthetic learners uh, might sound a little bit like uh, the distracting students in the classroom. They move, they move around a lot, they seem to be distracted, they're fidgeting, they're distracting others. Uh, but with technology, we can actually help them be more engaged and shine through their, through their characteristics. So I will like to take this last bit of time with our webinar to show you a very specific app that I am suggesting for your kinesthetic learners. So um, on the webinar invitation, you were suggested to have already this app uh, downloaded. I hope some of you did. If you didn't, I will show it right now. Okay, so this is the app, it's called Goose Chase. This is the logo. And if you, haven't, uh, if you don't have it on your phone already, I would suggest that you go on the App Store or on the Google Play Store, depending on the type of phone that you have. I will once again share the download link with you in the, in the chat so that you can download it and we will wait a few minutes for you to have it. Okay, oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. There it is on the chat. So we have a comment for toddlers with bad behavior, maybe the best that we can do is to keep them busy. Plan an engaging and dynamic class, ask them to do jobs for us. Yes, uh, there was already one comment uh, before this about having them be the, the assistants in the class, keeping them busy is very, very good suggestion for, for the management of our classroom with these students. You make them feel important and special and you prevent disruptive behavior. I absolutely agree. Uh, for classroom management, that's very good. The suggestion that I'm giving you today is uh, particularly useful for this. You can use it whenever, but for this period of time when every, when every student is working from home or learning from home, I should say, uh, this is a very good way of keep them also moving. This is only for phones or can I do it on my PC? Uh, it is for mobile because you'll, be, you'll need to snap some pictures or take a short video. So it's best that you do it on your phone. Okay, so while we wait a little bit for, um, for everybody to have the app, I'm going to show you a video so that we learn a little bit about what we're gonna do. Here it goes. Scavenger hunts are an exciting way to bring people together, but a nightmare to organize. Huh? You don't want to run like a chicken with its head cut off, so what do you do? Goose Chase will let you keep your head. Goose Chase is a cool app that lets you effortlessly put together a memorable scavenger hunt. All you have to do is 1. Sign in 2. Create missions or choose missions from an extensive list and 3. Announce the event to your participants. Now you can sit back and enjoy. 
Participants download the Goose Chase app and join the game you created. They complete missions and game points by submitting a picture of themselves or their team members doing each challenge. When the time is up, the team with the most points wins. Participants run around, meet new people, complete challenges, collect points, and have a blast. So keep your head where it belongs and start your first scavenger hunt today with Goose Chase. Scavenger Hunt for the Masses. Yes, so I hope you were able to listen to the video. Uh, Goose Chase is, a, is an app that lets us create a scavenger hunt. And it's a very good idea to, or a very good um, tool to teach students how to solve problems as they play a game. So they have missions in this scavenger hunt. Kinesthetic learners in particular learn best when the information is presented as an interactive game because they can move around and do activities. I will also take the time to mention that right now Goose Chase is having a free upgrade if you want to create an account to use with your students. Due to the contingency that we're living at the moment, they have decided to open this up for K-12 teachers. So if you create a free account, they will upgrade you to an Educator Plus account that allows you to have more participants. So if you're already with your app, you have it downloaded on your phone, we will, Scaven oh, sorry. We will do a scavenger hunt. So we're gonna participate. This is the game code. So you can already go in, go in the game. I have not started it yet. So let's, uh, I'll, I will give you a few minutes. This is what you have to do. I'll, I'll give you the instructions. You will have to join as a guest on the app. Next, you will, well, you will enter the game code. And once you're in the game, you will pick a team. And just wait there for a minute. And then we, I will start the game. And we will all be able to do some missions. I will take this time to mention that the amount of participants is limited. So if you do not get to pick a team and enter the game, please don't worry. We will all be able to follow the action on my screen. So please already enter the game code. And in a second, I will show you, uh, I will start the game and I will show you the activity that we have to do. I uh, should mention, once I start the game on the app, you will find uh, one section that says missions. Read the missions carefully. Remember that there are other people in your team. So if they're faster than you, uh, you will find that some missions have already been completed. So pick a different one and, um, and read the instructions, basically. They will, tell us, they will tell you what you have to do and how you submit the fact that you completed the mission is through a picture on your phone or through a video. Uh, disclaimer, I will share your submissions on my screen. So if you don't want to take a selfie because you don't want people to see you, don't do it. Uh, you can take a picture of different things. Okay, uh, I'm, I am sharing you now the Goose Chase uh, screen. If you didn't get to see the, the game code, it's also right here in the left side uh, bottom of the screen, so you can still join. Yes, thank you for having shared it in the, in the chat as well. R79111. At the school that I work for, students are not allowed to bring their phones. Uh, hopefully, they are allowed to use them at home. We can, we can use this, uh, this period of time when students are working from home, and hopefully they have access to some sort of mobile device, either, either a tablet or a phone, How, um, and they can use this, um, this activity. 
Also, if, you're, if you want to keep using it once we go back to physical classrooms, just uh, my suggestion would be to have, have it be an ongoing activity um, that we don't necessarily have to do within the school. So you'll see in a minute the types of, uh, the types of uh, missions that we have to accomplish, but we can do them uh, throughout a week or throughout the whole learning year and have teams keep gaining points when they work from home. Okay, so I hope the participants are ready, the ones that were able to join. I repeat, if you were not able to join, don't worry, I will show the action on my screen. So I'm going to start game and you will find your missions on your phone. Wait, okay, five seconds. <laughs> the code, the code, once again, I'll write it on the chat is 379-111. Sorry, R79111. It's also right here in the corner. Oh, R79111. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, participants, for helping me out on the chat as well. I'm very uh, grateful for that. Wait, I'm trying to log in. You do not need to log in. You don't need to create an account. Just enter as a guest. On your screen, it will say uh, that you can log in as a guest. Yes, it says waiting to start because I have to press this button right here to start the game. And there was somebody, somebody who asked me if there is a different app to create the scavenger hunt. Uh, you do it on this website. So on goosechase.com. Okay, so now I'm gonna start, ready or not. Here we go. And I hope you are seeing the missions now on your, on your phone. I'm going to come down to the activity feed so that once you start submitting stuff, we, we're gonna be able to see it. Yes, yes, very good. I, I'm glad that you're able to see the missions. How many people can use the game? Um, with this type of account, I believe it's up to 40 participants. And we can have as many as, oh, as three, no, as 10 different um, teams as well. Yes, 40 participants. Okay. Okay, we have one submission. Guess the learning style. One from the blue team, one from the green team. Awesome, yes, you both earned your points. Uh, from this manager, I can also add a bonus or subtract. So there, are, there is one mission in there that I mentioned, I will give bonus points for effort. So if you, if you show a very good effort, I will give you bonus points. Okay, we have, yes, now yellow has joined in. Perfect. Okay, so we have teams with more than one submission. Let's see the activity feed. Guest learning style, visual learners. What was this mission? Videos, yes. 
Yes, typing is also a way to submit. Perfect. Uh, yellow submitted the photo of the table. So yes, the visual learners benefit a lot from having the information as a table with some colors, with some bold letters as well. So they have something to, to see that is um, highlighted basically. Let's see what else we have. So group by missions, no. So for guess the learning style, we have all these three uh, submissions. Visual learners, we also have a picture of Padlet. Yes, very good. This is a very visual, uh, visual tool. I don't know if you can tell, but I myself, I'm a predominantly visual learner. So hopefully that comes across in the, in the tools that I'm using. What else do we have? Who is this learning material for? the little video, instructional video about how to fold an origami uh, paper. So yes, you all have it right. I have not had to deduct any, any points because everybody is doing great. You have not had one single mistake so far. Types of learners. Yes, we have our first video, let's see. Blue team. Les trois façons que les étudiants apprennent, c'est quand ils sont en train de regarder, d'écouter et de faire. Les trois façons que les étudiants. Awesome! Thank you very much for this uh, blue team member that gave us the types of learners in French. Very well done. Thank you. Let's see, we have anything new, new, new submissions. Guess the learning style. Game code, hmm. I don't think this really uh, answers the question. <laughs> It's okay, don't worry about it. As you can see, we also don't have names at the moment in our, in our participants because we, um, we joined as guests. So they're all, all more or less anonymous. <laughs> I don't understand very well this game. Okay, so a scavenger hunt consists of missions. To answer your question, I'm going to go here in the mission section and show you how I created this. So in here we have the mission list and each mission is worth some points. And the way you show that you completed the mission is through snapping a picture or a video and sharing it. So these are the four missions that are available right now in this uh, particular game. You can have as many as you want. And there are also in here some mission banks. So in here, there are missions that are already created by, by the goose chase people. So this can, this can uh, include going outside, talking to people, uh, finding stuff in your city, lots of lots of things. So uh, from, for instance, this one says, find two black cars side by side. So most of them are created just to be fun and to be like a competition where you move about and you find stuff and create some, some challenges, this type of thing. But in our case as teachers, we can also use it for learning. So right now, my missions are related to the topic that we're discussing today, so the learning styles. 
but we could also create some missions that are related to some mathematical topic or some science topic. Uh, for example, let's think of something, for example, when we're looking at uh, simple machines, you're trapped in your house because we are uh, not able to go outside at the moment, but you can find with everyday things that you have in your house, identify some simple machines. Uh, a lever, a pulley, these type of things. We can also, for language class, uh, like this idea where our, um, our team member, blue team member, uh, recording himself uh, speaking in French, we could also do it with English. Visual learners, we have a new, a new submission. This is a VR headset, awesome. I'm going to give some bonus points to this uh, team member for showing us their very cool gadget. <laughs> okay, we also have a brand new video, I think. Oh, I know this person. Let's see. Yellow team. In Italian is auditorio visivo cinestesica. Amazing, thank you very much. And a third video. So all, all uh, teams have now completed this, uh, this mission. Visivo, auditorio, cinestetica. Also Italian, awesome. Nobody has picked German yet. <laughs> I understand. Probably we don't have any uh, native Germans in the audience, no worries. Who is this learning material for? Oh, this one is a video, let's see. The three styles in French. Types of learners, yes. Auditive, kinesthetic, uh, visual. The awesome, yes, uh, only uh, this, this was not uh, submitted in the right mission because this was about uh, identifying who the learning material was for. But don't worry about it. It's, uh, I understand your <laughs> what mission you were trying to, to, to submit. Yes, so we're going to stop right here. We're going to see our leaderboard. Let's see. We have the green team on the highest uh, ranking, first place, amazing. Congratulations, green team. I see that the blue and yellow team are tied for second. Um, you all did amazingly. Uh, as you can see, it was very close. So I'm gonna stop the game right here. I hope you enjoyed it. As you can see, it's very easy to participate. Anyone can do it. Okay, so we've stopped the game. Yeah, so just to show you a little bit of, of the manager here and, and Goose Chase, here is where you decide if you want to do teams or individual players, both are an option. You can create different teams. So right now we only use three, but it could be more. In here, you create the missions. It's very straightforward. As you can see, it can just be some text, or you can include an image, or you can include a link. So whatever you need. And if you have the Educator Plus account, which I mentioned is free at the moment, you can also have access to some, um, some scavenger hunts created by teachers so that you can implement them yourselves with some different topics. How can I go out of this game? Good question. On your app, you just go to the, to the little uh, home uh, icon. Let me just go in so that I can show you. And uh, once you're there in the home icon, it will say something like um, reset game, I think. 
Let me see. Yes, it's a, it says reset app. Home icon and reset app. Oh, I didn't write that very well. There it is. Okay, so what did you think of our game? Did you enjoy it? Do you think you could use it with your students? These are uh, the references for the, for the um, presentation in general. And Give me a second. Yep, so basically I'm showing you this slide already, but I'm not kicking you out, don't worry. I want to hear you. I want to see your comments. I want to hear your suggestions or your questions as well, and I'll do my best to answer them. It is useful, a lot of fun. Everybody can learn, everybody can participate. Yes, absolutely. Uh, in general, about the learning, learning styles, um, did, you, did you have any questions, any comments? Did you learn something about yourselves? Did you have some students in mind? that you identify with some of these learning styles? Also, we are going to be showing uh, very soon our, our poll, our encuesta. So please answer it. It's very important to us. Can you write it? Yes, of course, I will write my email in the chat. Um, to everyone. Yep, that's me. Thank you, everybody, for stay tuned. Thank you, Sophie, for your excellent webinar. Um, Remember that tomorrow we will be having another webinar. It will be at the same um, time, also at the same hour, sorry, at 12 o'clock. And um, it will be very interesting. Please, tomorrow, because of the dynamic of tomorrow's webinar, we will be only accepting the entrance to the webinar uh, 50 minutes after 12. Okay, so please try to be on time in order to... Uh, enter our, our webinar tomorrow. And please don't forget to answer this um, encuesta <laughs> before you leave. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everybody. I enjoyed giving you this webinar today. I hope it was interesting to you and thank you for your participation.